Welcome to another edition of Paranormal Plus. We got Dennis Carroll with us tonight. Hello, Kathy. Good evening. Hello, Good evening, Mark. sir. Hello, Stuart. Hello, everybody. Crazy Witch, Gary. How's everybody doing tonight? The Nana Boss. So, yes. So, I got me a new little gadget. I got my uh, EMF detector. Uh, uh, guy uh, Eric makes them. Uh, ah. it, it, it's a little skull one. Uh, that's easy to spot, too, by the way, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Just look for so, the skull. Uh, yeah. It actually it, it lights up. Of course, with ah. my, my, my background, you can't see it. Oh, but... Uh, I'm going to have it on during the show, so just in case if anything happens. Yeah, well, I was, uh, I was watching your show earlier about haunted objects, and I've had a lot of history with haunted objects and some of the stuff you've got going on in your studio from time to time. Uh, I hope you got your holy water handy in case we run into any malevolent spirits tonight. There you yes, go. I do. Right. I've got it. <laughs> Yeah, just so, in case. It's always it's always good to be safe on the safe side. Yeah, it but, is. Uh, uh, I've, I've been involved in spirit research, Chris, for a long, long time. I'm not going to say how many years because I hope I don't look that old. But uh, I've been involved in a long time. You know, and I was just thinking tonight, since uh, we're going to be talking about this subject, I was thinking about the very, very, very first experience I had with the other side, you might say, the unseen. And uh, when I was a kid, about uh, I think I was about 10 years old, we lived in a haunted house, actually. This house was a big old two-story house. And uh, the, the old man that had lived in this house, his name was Broadwell. He was a miser, you know, kind of like Scrooge. He was kind of a miser, and when he died, they cut holes and a lot of the walls in his house looking for his money, that he might, any money he might have left behind. But there, um, there was some really freaky stuff that went on there. I'll tell you two quick ones right quick. At night, a lot of times, you could hear the door. There was a door to the stairwell that went upstairs. And my mother, who was always afraid of fire, she didn't want me to sleep upstairs. She wanted me to sleep downstairs. But at night, you could hear this door open sometimes very late at night, and it was like somebody going up the steps, you know. So one night I got up, I said, is that my mother or my father or somebody going up the steps, you know? Because I heard it more than once on one occasion, you know. And I went and I got up and I went in and I opened the door. I had a flashlight, shined it up. There's nobody. My, my mother and father were asleep in bed. There was nobody else in the house but me and him. And, uh, and that went on a lot of times. You could actually hear these footsteps going up. And they were very dragging like they were. They weren't quick. They were very slow. It's like an older person, an elderly person would, would walk. So that was interesting. And I'll tell you one more quick one. One day I was sitting there watching TV. It's been a lot. It was an old TV set, you know, one of the old analog TV sets. And uh, it was in the wintertime, so none of the doors were open, you know, none of the doors in the house. We didn't used to have air conditioning back in the old days. Uh, we had window fans, and you left the screen doors open, you know. You left the right, open screen doors. Right, right, yeah. But this was in the wintertime, and I was sitting there watching TV, and honest to gosh, I'm sitting there, and I hear the door lock, the door latch click on this door, and the door was shut between me and the living room, okay? And it just went click like somebody turned the knob. I was sitting there looking at it. 
The knob turned. And I thought my mother was coming in or somebody, you know. And the door just slowly swung open. There wasn't nobody there. And I'm sitting there staring. And I said, well, that's freaky, you know. And the first thing I thought about was the wind, but there were no doors or windows open. And the house wasn't drafty, you know. I said, I remember. Because when I'm sitting there looking, honest to gosh, that door slowly closed by itself and locked, clicked back on yeah, no, I'm good. <laughs> no, I'm good. No, 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 no. <laughs> that was a wild experience. I'm sitting there like, oh, what could have done that? But one more, I'll tell you right quick. When I was about four, I think I was about 12 years old. This was a few years after that. See, uh, some of the kids and I in the neighborhood, there was an old house in the neighborhood that everybody said was haunted. This was uh, 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 a few neighborhoods over from where I originally lived in that house. And everybody said this whole house was haunted. We wanted to go in this house because it was boarded up and everything, you know. When nobody lived in it. And we finally, here's we know kids being kids, we broke in the back door of this house. And we got in this, and it's just like out of a horror movie. All the furniture's covered with sheets. There's cobwebs everywhere. It was a spooky-looking house. So um, I I think there were maybe about four of the kids with me. I went on in the living room, and they went down the hall to some of the other rooms in this house because there must have been ten rooms in this house, okay? And that was just the the bottom part, not the upstairs. So I go to the stairs, and I see a, I see a baseball land on the floor there, you know. And I said, ah, oh, some some kid threw it through the window, you know, and they were too scared to come in and try to get it, you know. So I uh, I was gonna get the baseball, but I said, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna go on upstairs a moment. I'm gonna run upstairs and check, see what's up there. I'm always been curious, maybe too curious sometimes. <laughs> so I said, I'm gonna do that. I put my hand on the banister, and honestly, gosh, Chris, as I started putting my foot on that first step, right in my ear, not whispering, I mean loud. I could feel the vibration of this, right in my ear. Get out, just like that. And I, I jumped back. I said, well, I thought for a minute it was one of those kids playing, you know, a trick on me or something. But I look, and they're all still down the hall. I'm in this room alone. Well, I didn't take, you know, that for being a sign I was very welcome. So I said, I'm getting the heck out of here, you know. So I left them, and I told the other kids, I'm leaving by, and I left. And, uh, you know, uh, that was a very freaking experience. And that was something that really got – and I, it didn't dawn on me till later what really, truly – took place you know it takes me sometimes it takes you a while to to, to uh to uh, uh understand these things that you what right. you've been through it can be right. sort of kind of a shock yeah. later on i'm going god that was an unseen entity in that house and they didn't want me in there but i mean i could actually feel the vibration just like the wind of someone speaking you know the the force of it was loud and i it was very startling, and to me, that was my first real true experience, I think, with actual unseen communication, you might say, because it communicated very well with me. Yeah, no, I, I'm good. I'm good. So you saw the show where FDL was asking questions, and the REM pod was responding. I was like, hmm? you know, I'm like, well, wait, does, what are it, you it, doing? It, you know, it shocks you. Yeah, yeah, it, it shocked me. I, I tell people, people say, are you just scared? No, there's a difference between being scared and being startled. You know, you know, it's a shock. A start to be startled is different than being actually scared, you know, because if you get scared, you have a reaction, a fight or flight thing, you know. Uh, but the startle is like you're just kind of in shock, you know, and that happened to me when I saw those demonic spirits. And i tell you something else, and I was just thinking about it. The other day, I worked for 30 years at a local hospital. I want to tell you something. That is one of the most haunted places you can ever go in is a hospital. And I've had a lot of experiences at that yeah. hospital. Yeah. And uh, not just houses. It can be a lot of different areas. It's not just a house. Uh, I've been in a lot of supposedly haunted graveyards uh, all night long. I have investigated many parts of Charleston, South Carolina, which is one of the most haunted cities in the world i spent one night at uh, uh, all alone by myself and you talk about one spooky looking place all alone by myself on a place called rope makers alley in the heart of the city 
where supposedly you can see the shadow of a murdered pirate on the wall. Uh, I was hoping he would show up all night, but I don't think he ever did. But uh, if he did, I didn't know it. But um, you can get into some very interesting places. So it's not just houses. It can be a lot of different areas. But here's the thing about it, Chris. It's a lot. A lot of these areas are haunted, and uh, and we've talked about this demonically wise. But we can talk about this human spirit wise too. A lot of places are haunted by the trauma, like battlefields and stuff like that, where people die. And what could be more traumatic than death? You know. Right. And I've had some cases. I've had some cases where I think people who traumatically died were sort of caught in a vortex between life and death because they didn't really, I don't think they really knew where they were going or, or if they were caught somehow or another. It's a very strange concept that the spirit could actually be caught in between places. Uh, but I've had to do what I've called several soul rescues uh, where you actually address these entities and let them know it's time for them to go on over. Uh, and not stay there anymore. Uh, I've had some very interesting cases like that. And of course, there's my other favorite is residual hauntings. That's a fascinating subject in, uh, unto itself because what you're, you're dealing with, I call them, are the ghost of memories. Right. They're ghosts of memories of that place. And uh, I'll tell you a quick scientific thing. I want you to think about this. This is wild. Um, it has been proven scientifically that water, now this is a little water here, water can retain a memory. Okay, now I know that sounds freaky, but it's true. Water conducts energy. We know that, okay? Water right. conducts energy. And that's part of the, the process of us retaining a memory, okay? Think about, Chris, how much around you right now where you're sitting is, has water in it or has an amount of moisture to it. Think about that. The very walls around you contain that. Not just in the floors, the carpets, the ceilings. You're surrounded by water or liquid that way, you know, that kind of a liquid. Think about that a moment and then, think, then take that and put it somewhere where something very bad or traumatic happens. Murder. I've, I've, I've investigated a lot of murder suicide areas, okay? Um, I know there was a double murder area I investigated not long ago. You're talking about a very eerie place. Very eerie. Anyway, uh, this was like, this was like uh, a murder that was uh, during a robbery. So you know there were heightened tensions, there were heightened emotions taking place during this. It was traumatic, you know? And uh, so it definitely leaves that memory, I think. It imprints that memory. That's sort of what we call, you know, we think about as residual haunting. But a lot of times I think residual haunting is tied also to the concept of time and space. We may be seeing, for just a moment, we may be able to see back into the past. You know, like, a, like watching a movie film, you know. Uh, we may be seeing that, and they may not can see us, but we can see them. And sometimes I wonder, I have to wonder how many times it goes the other way. They can see us, but we can't see them, you know. Right. And are right. we ghosts to them? You know, that's an interesting concept. Are we ghosts in their time period if they see us? So uh, that's an interesting thing, too. That's really, really to me far out, but I, I like the thought of uh, – of, of, of images like this that never go away. They're always there if you can only access them some way or another. I believe that's true. I believe they never that it never goes or dies away. That it's there, existing in some ethereal field or whatever it may be around us. If we can only just pluck it out and watch it or listen to it, who knows what we might see or hear. It is. It's it's a very fascinating subject. You know, we always have questions about it. Uh, you know, the last show, it, it's weird because sometimes we have activity, sometimes we don't. You know, and it's it's strange. Why does it happen? And how can it happen from one country to another? Mm -hmm. And yeah, not how, happen sometimes. 
Right. You know, uh, I think it's a matter, and I've said this to people before, Chris. I've had a lot of people say, why can't you find this? Why can't you? I say, well, if I could make the paranormal perform when I want it to, I would be a very rich man, <laughs> okay? I could really do some stuff. But you, it's not that way. I think you just have to be in the right place at the right time sometimes, and the atmosphere has to be right. A lot of factors have to kind of uh, click into place for some things to happen because, you know, I know a lot of people that on nights of the full moon, they say there's more prevalence of hauntings. Or when there's like a thunderstorm or a dark, stormy night, uh, there's more energy in the air. Uh, you, you, your chances are heightened by that, okay, of actually running into something in that respect. But I think you just got to be in the right place a lot of times at the right time. And you got to be open to this, okay? Here's another thing, Chris, we have to look at. If you're making a connection with the spirit world, you got to be open on your end, okay? You got to be open. This is a two way thing here, you know? And if you go into something very doubtful or disbelieving or shutting yourself down, and not opening up to what may be there, what you may encounter, you've already defeated yourself at the beginning, I think, to a certain degree. If you see or experience something, you're going to be incredibly lucky under those uh, circumstances. So I think a lot of times if we're more open to it, our minds are open to it, spiritually we're open to it, then I think you may actually have that experience you're looking for. That connection, that communication. Uh, I've noticed that a lot of times in a lot of different cases I've had where uh, your attitude plays a big, big role in it. Yeah, that is true. Thank you, Catherine. I greatly appreciate that. Yes, thank you. But it, it just makes me wonder because, you know, it doesn't act on command, right? So, uh, and because if that was the case, you know, uh, everybody that's uh, on the fishing show would catch all the fish, you know, in, in 20 minutes, like they always do when we watch them, right? Wow. So, it makes you wonder, but it, it's interesting how they, you can ask questions and it actually I've responds. Had, I've had instances, Chris, where you go all night and nothing happens and they're right at the very end, bam. You know? Uh, they're not on our time. we got to remember that. It's like when you're doing EVPs or you're checking stuff out with an EMF, please remember these people, wherever they, whatever plane they're existing, they're not on our time. And we're not on theirs, really. I mean, we've got to understand that. And I've told a lot of people, I've mentored a lot of groups over the years. I say, when you do an EVP, give it four or five minutes to answer back, okay? Before you ask the next question. Give it, because uh, it's not on our time. Who knows what kind of a time sequence thing is going on here, you know? So a lot of times they go through there, blah, 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 bounce one question after another. You don't even give them time to answer you. If they are going to answer, you know? Right, right. No, but you know, I mean, it's not like it's not like ghost hunters on TV. You don't go in. Oh, yeah, okay, run into something. It takes hours, maybe sometimes more than one trip there to get that that thing. You know, it's yeah. the way it goes. Yeah, and a lot of people don't realize it. It, it takes you know two or three days worth of filming to get you know that forty minutes to make that show. You know, so, uh, somebody. Asked me one time, what was the one place I would investigate? I said, I would dearly love to inv investigate Dracula's castle, but I'm not going to do it in a couple of nights. I want you to drop me there and leave me for at least a couple of weeks because <laughs> that's just the way that goes. You've got to go, you've got to become part of that environment for one thing. That is a major thing. And I talk about that in my book, Beyond the Shadows, a field guide to the paranormal. You've got to become part of that environment for them to accept you. Because once you go in there, you're something new. You're a threat, like to them, to a certain extent. You're 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 messing things up when you should really start trying to assimilate yourself into those surroundings and making you. It's just like very much like deer hunting. Okay, the most successful deer hunters are sitting up in a in a, uh, a box or a blind up in a tree, and the deer can't see them. They're part of a the environment, you know, that's the best way to handle that. Uh, although you have to 
you have to try to communicate, but I'm saying give it time to settle down. But everything has to settle down and get back to its normalcy before you start actively investigating something like that, you know? That makes sense. I mean, that's actually true. I mean, you can't just go tracing out in the woods. You got to wait and let everything, you know, calm back down and, and be still and quiet, you know, especially being an ex-deer hunter myself. So, you know, so that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, but they don't show you that on TV, though. You said those hours upon hours that you got to sit there in a dark room all along by yourself waiting for something uh, to take place because that's not Hollywood, okay? <laughs> that's boring. And it is boring. I have gone to sleep several times and sitting there, you know, waiting for something to happen. I kind of doze off a little bit. It is boring, but you got to try to stay as much attentive as possible because little things can go on. Isn't it? Sometimes, Chris, it's not something big like a chair moving across the floor. It can be little things. It can be like maybe a little statue on something moves or something vibrates. You've got to be very attentive to what you're doing, you know, because you got to remember this. They're not playing by your rules, okay? They don't, they've got a different whole ball game going. They're not, they're not going by your rules, think you should be this and they should be doing that. You can't tell them what to do because they're going to do what they want to do. Uh, that's just the way that goes. Um, so you've got to be very attentive. You got, as we say, used to say in law enforcement, observe everything. Right. And that's what you got to do. Yeah. Right. So, so what do you, what is your favorite tools to go on investigated when you go hunting, ghost hunting? What, what do you like to take with you when you used to go? I had two very favorite tools of mine. EMF meters, which I like. I had a very good uh, the trifield is my favorite, by the way. The trifield. So it is a scientific instrument, by the way. It's used by scientists all over the world, not just for ghost hunting. Um, the trifield meter is my favorite uh, because it, it, it covers different areas and different types of signals and electricity and EMF force fields and stuff like that. And my other second, second favorite tool, you might say it's the tool, is my dog. I used to take a dog with me. Uh, he was very hypersensitive to EMF. He, uh, he was a really valuable asset because I'll tell you one thing about dogs and cats. I never heard of a cat taking, being taken on the investigation, but that might be interesting. But uh, the dog <laughs> is not going to lie to you. He's not going to tell you a lie or give you his opinion. He's only going to tell you what he's experiencing and what instinct is working on him with that experience. So you can really take that to the bank if that dog reacts in a certain way. And I believe me, I've had some very interesting uh, dog things go on in the investigation. Uh, you know something is definitely there. And that dog, nine times out of ten, could sense something that that EMS detector never could. So that's an interesting aspect of it. It was a living instrument, you might say, an instrument tool. Um, you know, dogs are used for a lot of things and being in law enforcement, we knew that for drug sniffing and bomb sniffing and, and weapons sniffing and all this other stuff. Dogs can be an invaluable tool in this type of research as well. Yeah, that makes sense. That would they just give you signs where like where they look in a direction or would they just puff up their ears and be like, huh? That you got to watch them close because of the different little signs they give you, like a bird dog. Now, my dog is a bird dog, by the way. He's a cocker spaniel, he's laying over here on the floor right now. As a matter of fact, he's retired now, by the way. Anyway, uh, <laughs> he uh, uh, bird dogs are very, I like the more sensitive hunting dogs for this because their senses and their instinct are highly tuned, uh, to that respect. Um, you got to watch their mannerisms. Their mannerisms will tell you a lot. They can tell you if they're like looking a little nervous or if they're sensing something. You got to watch the movement of their head, the tail, the eyes, what they're looking at, and all that. They can, that can tell you a lot that there's something there with you that you may not be able to feel. But let me tell you a quick story talking about something being there. Uh, I was investigating this house one time and I was actually in the garage. It had a built on garage an enclosed garage, and I was in the garage because some activity had taken place there, 
And it was on a hot summer night, Chris, and this garage was closed. It had no windows. It had only a big roll-up door, and the door was shut. The door between the house and the garage was shut. So I'm sitting in this. It's, it had to be 90 degrees in this garage. And I'm sitting there with another guy. And I'm sitting there with a, uh, a, a temperature probe in my hand. A temp gun, as we used to call them. And uh, I'm sitting there with it, and all of a sudden, I could feel something approach me. Uh, and I'll tell you why I could feel it. It was, no, it was not like a wind, but it was sort of like a movement. Uh, that you can see, feel, but not see, if you can understand what I'm saying. Yes. You can feel it, but you don't see it. And I started, I, I turned the meter on to start gauging that, and it was 90 degrees in there. And all of a sudden, it starts going like 88 degrees. It was 85 degrees, and it's like it's coming closer towards me. And then it gets down. Finally, it got down to like 82 degrees before it started walk going away. Now, that's a dramatic temperature drop. Uh, uh, and it was a cold spot. It was sort of like a moving cold spot. Well, I got up and immediately started looking for drafts. That's where these temp guns come in really handy for. And of course, they could use them for air conditioning and refrigeration compare and all that. But this is another interesting way to use them. I started going on the walls, the ceiling, the floor. The floor was concrete. The ceiling and walls had absolutely no drafts. It was 90 degrees everywhere I put that thing. Wow. So what approached me sitting there? Well, definitely, it was something, you know, definitely. Yeah, I uh, I use one of those too. I got my handy right right behind my curtain uh, because that night that uh, I was holding one of my dolls, I was trying to tell people in the audience and watching how cold the feet were. They're like ice cubes, yeah. and I was like, and and of course I didn't have my temp gun where I can actually shoot shoot the feet and show everybody how cold it was. So they have to rely on on my testimony, which right. you know, people that don't know, he's like, yeah, right, whatever, right, you know, and you know, right. it's just something else to show people, right? Is evidence. It's, it's another tool in in your kit. Right. So, but and when that dog got yanked, it was like, what? Because Michael with the FDL was like, what was that? You know, what just happened? You know, in his UK accent. And, and when I was holding a doll at the bottom of its feet, it like somebody took the arms and was like, give it here. And when it did that, I yanked back as it yanked forward and the doll came out. And that, whoop, that was me, ladies and gentlemen. I got too close to the EMF detector. So that's false alarm. But it, it, it yanked down my hand. So... Uh, I did a real good cleansing about three weeks ago in the studio, like I told you, on one of the shows prior. And, uh, and the activity subsided quite a bit, but it's starting to ramp back up. But it's not bad. The uh, only thing it's doing now, uh, on the last show, it turned off my over. If you look at my glasses, you can, you can tell I got a light on, right? You see the glare. Yeah, I, I got a light on so it would turn the light off during the show. And I'm like, I just turned my light off. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa. And uh, they were like, did you just turn Grizzly's light off? And the EMF, the the one that Eric made, uh, the skull, it beeped. It would go beep, 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 beep. And it, 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 would, it, would, it would respond to their questions and answer. And it was just like, it's, the, it's, it's just crazy how you That's can crazy. actually, you know, interact with things but you know my question is is what are you interacting with is is the question that's the that is the premier question chris you know uh, and i've talked to a lot of investigators about this researchers and all you know once you take that demonic card off the table what are you really dealing with you know if you can make sure it's not demonic in that respect and you got to be very careful with that because they're so downright tricky they know how to pull the wool over your eyes. They're not careful. Then you've got to ascertain what it is you're dealing with. Is it human? Is it elemental? Or what the case may be, you know, uh, or is it, you know, here's, a, here's a lot of things a lot of people discount. Could he be an animal? 
type spirit. I believe animals have spirits, definitely. Um, could it be that? You got to you got to ascertain what it is you're dealing with and what's trying, trying what's playing with you, trying to communicate to you, or why, or how it's doing that. It's very that's very important. That's part of, that is I call it the main major part of your investigation. First, find out what you're dealing with. You know, that's what you got to do. So when you used to go in on your investigations, I mean, did you ever do your uh, EVPs and stuff like that? And I mean, oh, I've had I've been cussed out on EVPs several times. <laughs> Very bad words. Uh, uh, those were usually uh, uh, EVPs uh, and also uh, radios. You know, the tuning radios, the uh, the uh, boxes. Right, uh, voice boxes, yeah, and all that. I've had them do that as well, and they be, they can be kind of rough. And most of the time, when that happens, you're usually dealing with demonic spirits. Uh, they love to they love to curse curse you out, you know. But uh, uh, sometimes you can run into uh, uh, what I would say would, and I think it's it's kind of rare that this happens. And I'm gonna lay something kind of weird on you now. Sometimes you can run into what I call imprisoned spirits uh these are like either held behind by demonic forces or either held in check or held behind by something left undone by something that they dreadfully need to do or something that that was undone or not done or whatever the case may be it's an emotional prison for them so to speak you know uh in that respect you got to understand, like I said, it's very important You understand where they're coming from, what you're dealing with. And, of course, another big aspect of all this investigation, Chris, is your history of that place and the people that may have been there. But that's very important because that's going to tell you a lot more than even an EVP a lot of times, you know. But EVPs are important to that respect, but you've got to be very careful. They're, they can be contaminated very easily. And, uh, and you're never going to find the perfect spot or the perfect situation for the perfect EVP. It just don't happen because there's going to be some outside noise. It's going to pick up your breathing. Uh, I've even had uh, instruments that can almost pick up your heartbeat, you know. Uh, you've got to understand there's ambient sound no matter what you do. And you've got to be, try to screen as much of that out as possible when it comes to EVPs. But uh, my favorite of the class a evps you can under, undeniably understand them definitely i had one one time it concerned my dog we were going in a, in a haunted barn and uh, i had a young lady with me and my dog would not go in that barn by the way i had to leave him outside he would not go in that barn he'd follow me anywhere but he would not go in that barn so i went in there and we're doing well looking around and the girl with me she's doing the evp and she's asking questions I think one of the questions is, you know, how did you die or something like that? And it kept repeating over and over again. It did it about three or four times. Whale. Whale. So I got to thinking, what the heck? You don't have a whale. So I go back and I asked the woman that owned that barn. I said, uh, you do uh, you know if anybody died in that barn or what? You know, trying to get more information out of her. She said, no, not as long as I know. I said, well, do you have an old whale here on your property? And she said, yeah, there's one in the barn. Wow. I would have left to have excavated that whale. Because who knows what you might would have found. Wow. Yeah, that's very interesting. So you never know what an EVP is going to tell you. And you might have to unravel the clues to it sometimes. But they're very important for that respect. Uh, you ever have you heard of what we used to call grave whispering? No. Uh. -uh. Yeah. Well, you can actually supposedly put a, a tape recorder down on a grave and talk to the who is ever in that grave and, and see if they will whisper something back to you. That's a very old trial that they, they've what? been going on for a long, long time. But uh, they some people have said they have has successfully picked up this whispering. And there, I, why it's whispering, I don't know. It, it's not very loud, but it's it, it's very distinct. But I have to wonder if it's sort of sometimes 
uh, Chris, sort of like in a pareidolia with the sound and not the side. Uh, are you really hearing somebody trying to communicate with you uh, or what, you know? But the grave whispering is very freaky stuff. I've heard some interesting things out of it. Stingray, I can, I can, I can picture Stingray <laughs> going to a cemetery. And and you got to actually lay down on the grave with the recorder and hold it down and ask oh, a question. No, 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 <laughs> no, no, I, I, no, no, I, no, 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 I've never done it myself, but I've my seen it luck, done. I would do that and I would hear some banging, the earth would move, I would hear somebody mumble, uh, no, no. I, that 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 is too spooky. I I agree with you, Stingray. Uh, well, you know there is it, a part. No. There is a part, Chris, of necromancy. I know you you know what necromancy is. Yes. But that you are supposed to be able to bend over a dead body, put your ear to their lips, and ask it a question. There's a certain ritual you go through. I'm not going to get into that. I don't want any amateurs trying to do that. But um, you can put your ear, and they're supposed to whisper back to you. It's kind of like the grave whispering answer and answer your question whatever question it is you ask them and you actually see this uh, in a movie what was the name of that movie I jonah hex you remember yeah. jonah hex he does yeah. that in the movie you know he digs his old partner up and he that's, uh, that's grave whispering too that's part of necromancy communication with the dead no i had no idea I'm going to I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have to start asking some of these new uh, generation people about mm -hmm. grave whispering. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I mean, can you imagine? Now, ladies and gentlemen, I used to patrol. There is one more yards. thing about that, Chris. You do never, you never ever want to dance on someone's grave. You, know, you can get supposedly cursed in, instantly by the people that that are lying there because that was a very awful disgrace to dance on someone's grave and you might you might get an attachment that way supposedly some people's claim that has gotten uh very much like divots you know attachment from dancing on grave do not do that if you're going to dance don't grant dance in a graveyard it's kind of a good idea wow uh, i mean have you not ever patrolled a graveyard or a cemetery when you was on the force i had to well, I've had some freaky things happen in some cemeteries. Uh, my, matter of fact, when I first got into uh, spirit research, I went to a cemetery that's here in our town that had a very interesting reputation of being haunted. And sure enough, that night I actually saw ghost lights out in that cemetery, corpse lights, whatever they name you want to call them. And I actually chased those things all night trying to get close to them. And the, you would try to advance to it, and the closer you get to it, it'd go further away from you. Uh, and if you backed up, then he would get close. It was like playing a game with you, you know. Uh, those were corpse lights. That's still an under, to me, that's, I call them earth lights. I think there's a natural explanation for it and maybe not a spiritual thing, but who knows? Uh, there could actually be some spiritual type manifestation like that as well. Yeah. So you got yeah. some freaky things. Freaky things go on in graveyards. <laughs> Uh, well, the the stuff that we always caught in graveyard was people doing certain things, and then the oh, illegal yeah. activity, right? So uh, that is we, a, that is one actual danger you run into with certain cemeteries: people having done certain rituals that may have opened doors and let certain forces out there. That you'd have to be very very careful. A lot. That is the very first thing I check for, Chris. When I go into an old cemetery, and I've been in a lot of old cemeteries, the first thing I check for is to make sure there's not some kind of ritualistic stuff going on there. Uh, you look for telltale signs on the ground, around the graves, and stuff, candles, all that kind of stuff. You make sure nothing like that, as much as possible, has gone on there. Then you kind of feel like you know you've got a little leg up in the saddle on that, that you know what may have happened around there. Because uh, uh, you have a lot of shadow person activity in these graveyards. You have a lot of demonic activity, a big time. The, the demonic loves graveyards, cemeteries, uh, morgues, and places like that. Uh, they're, they're big on that. 
So whatever kind of spirit you're dealing with, whether it be evil, human, animal, what, elemental, whatever it is, they seem to be drawn to graveyards for some unusual reason. The places of the dead. I, I just can't imagine being on patrol, regular mm -hmm. routine patrol, and, mm -hmm. and driving through a graveyard on a Friday or Saturday night, think you're going to catch a bunch of kids doing whatever, drinking, and, and pulling up and, and blacking out and sneaking through there and hitting your spotlight and seeing five or six people laying down on top of graves and all rising up at the same. No, I'm not no <laughs> grave whispering. No, I, I'm good. Well, the, uh, uh, no. the part about it lying down on the grave is like you're, you're sort of, you're sort of putting yourself on their level and you're opening that kind of door of communication there, which really not good. I don't advise people to do this because you who knows what you're liable to really do on. But um, you kind of get on their level, and that's where that's why you lay down on it, and you put that ear to the grave, and you put your recorder there. Supposedly, uh, you can get whisperings. Uh, but with, but here here's something else I better tell you folks. It's probably not the person that's lying there in that grave that's doing the whispering. It's probably demonic. They yeah. love to do that. Now, I demonic probably, oh, masquerades I a lot as uh, they masquerade a lot as human spirits to fool you. Into that. Well, yeah, that, that I know they do, but I would probably lay, leave a tape recorder on the grave, but I wouldn't lay on the grave, lay down on top of it, no. Well, some people have put the uh, uh, put the recorder just on the grave and see what they would get, and I've heard some interesting stuff that way, but the way to do it is supposed to lay down on the grave. You get on their level, get down as close to them as possible. For your communication. Yeah, I'm good. No, that's, that's, no. That's freaky, yeah. Yeah, it is. I learned something new tonight. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, uh, that actually just blew my mind, so. But you know, the, the holy grail of spiritual research, Chris, is the full-bodied apparition, which I've seen several of them. Uh, it's always interesting when you see that. Sometimes it can be either a residual or can be an actual human spirit. Uh, that is the, the Holy Grail. That's what you look for, that full-bodied apparition. Uh, that is something to see because it is, uh, it is very, very interesting. And uh, the one I saw once of an, of an elderly lady, uh, was so real, I didn't know it was a ghost. That's the, that's the weirdest part of it all. I thought it was somebody because it, you couldn't see through it. It looked solid, it, and it moved just like a regular person or an elderly person would across the hall. And I saw it, but it was not a living person. It was a ghost. I thought, what else can I tell you it was? A ghost or a... And I don't think it was a demon masquerading as this lady, because she was a nice old lady in life. I don't think she would have had any kind of a demonic connection. Uh, I believe it was an actual human spirit. and uh, But they are more rare than people really realize. You know, Hollywood tells you you run into one every time you turn a corner. That's not true. Uh, uh, human spirit manifestation is very rare to many occasions. More rare than people think. So, so when I saw that full eyes body up here, I thought it was a person. I really did. Until later, I found out it wasn't. Wow. So what do you think about the black mirror? Have you ever heard of that? Oh, yeah. Uh, I've run into uh, on occasion several times uh, people that have, it's called scrying, by the way, that have messed right. around with black mirrors. You can also do this, by the way, if you want to get modern-wise, with a blank TV screen. Uh, it's very much similar to a black mirror, if you think about it. And I'm talking about when it's turned off and it's black, you know, there's no power on it. Uh, you can also do this with water, black water in a pan, supposedly, as well. So it's not just a mirror. Let me tell you something freaky about mirrors, though. You know the number one thing, I, I'm just going to blow your mind, I don't know if you know this or not. The number one thing demons hate 
It's not a crucifix. It's not holy water. The it's reflection. a mirror. It's a mirror. They can't stand their own reflection. Yeah. They can use mirrors. They can appear in mirrors and use mirrors, but they will not ever want to see themselves in a mirror or even in water for that matter because they look so terribly horrible. They would not, you would not want to know that you look like that. And I think that's the number one thing. And I have actually been in a lot of the old houses where they had mirrors in every window facing out to keep demons out of the house. That's creepy. That's great. Is that why a lot of the old houses had all the mirrors in the, in the homes? Oh, yeah. Mirrors were something. And, you know, once upon a time, Chris, a mirror was a very expensive item. And a lot of the mirrors many years ago had real silver backing to them. So yes. they were very valuable. So that's one of the many reasons why you have superstitions about handling them. Don't break a mirror and all this stuff. They were very valuable. You didn't want the little kids playing with them. Definitely. Uh, but here's the interesting thing about the mirror. It has almost a connection, a strange connection to the soul in some aspects. When you look in the mirror and you're seeing yourself, you confront yourself. And then, let me tell you another freaky thing. According to superstition, if you notice, let's say, if uh, you wanted to check up on your girlfriend and find out if she really was a real person and not some other kind of an entity, you would catch her sleeping at midnight and look at her reflection in the mirror. And if it's human, you're okay. But if it's something else, you might want to consider getting another girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> that's supposed to be able, while you asleep, your true image supposedly shows in the mirror. Well, I did not know that. Yeah. Did not know so that. So they, uh, they have a lot of superstitions and a lot of... A lot of spiritual connection to mirrors. Uh, you should never, ever sleep with mirrors crossing each other. Because if you have two mirrors crossing you, you're like looking into infinity. And it's sort of like a opening a portal, they say. And it's a danger of that. Uh, that's the only way demons you truly use mirrors. They can use them in certain ceremonies. But like I said there again, they will not. Like the vampire who can't see himself in the mirror. Uh, they would not want to see themselves in the mirror. They hate mirrors. They absolutely hate mirrors. They do not like them at all. Uh, and, cer and certain connections with ghosts and mirrors. I have had many stories. I've never actually seen one of people seeing ghosts in the mirrors. They turn around, and there's nothing there, but they can see it in the mirror. That's an interesting aspect. The mirror can see things we can't. Yeah, we see that a lot in horror movies. Where somebody's uh -huh. looking in the mirror and they're like, and they turn around and nothing's there. Yep. So. The mirror, here's the thing about the mirror, okay? You ever heard that expression, mirrors don't lie? Right. They don't. <laughs> they don't tell a lie. They tell the truth. And that's why demons, spirits, and all that supposedly have a thing about mirrors. They tell the truth. They don't like that. I don't like my mirror either. It tells the truth, too. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. There's an old so, man looking back at me out of my mirror. I don't know why I got in there, but that's when he goes. Yeah, right. So when you tell these new uh, investigators that are coming out on onto the market now and, and out there trying to ghost hunt and, and dabble into the, to the afterlife, what's your recommendations for them? Well, really, people should not dabble around in that kind of stuff, really. You not you need to be careful with that because, you know, even the Bible strictly forbids communication with spirits. Why? Because it's not, here's the thing about it, it's not what the communication is about. It's not what you might hear or what you might find out. And most of the time, you're going to be told a bunch of lies anyway. It's not that part of it. It's that, that, that danger of attachment. Okay, we've got to look at that. You know, that danger of attachment. If you deal with spirits, you're opening yourself up to having an attachment. And believe me, folks, you don't ever want to get an attachment because they can make your life a living hell. Okay, uh, whatever it may be, like the Dybbuk. You know, don't, don't open the Dybbuk box. You know, uh, don't, don't fool with these things because you run that risk of an attachment. 
that communication. Be very careful. I never went out of my way many times to communicate with a spirit. I punch them sort of to see if they were there and what they were and what I was dealing with. I didn't want to find out what Uncle Joe had to say about the lottery next week. I don't know. That's not what's in the mail. And if you ask questions about the other side, they're not going to tell you anything anyway most of the time, especially if it's a demonic spirit. They're only going to tell you a bunch of lies. No, what you're doing with investigation and research into these things is you're punching them to kind of figure out what it is you're dealing with. And that's why I say, and why I talk about that in my book, Beyond the Shadows, you have to approach it in a scientific sort of way to ascertain the information you want. Don't try to get all your information out of the spirit because, like I say, most of the time you're not. You know, so you've got to understand what you're dealing with, you kind of punch it, you kind of push it a little bit and see what it is and what kind of reaction you get. That's where you get a lot of your information on. What is the, every action has a reaction, even right. if you're dealing with a spirit, spiritual thing, you know. Every, everyone has, and you got you to gotta gauge what that reaction means and all that. That's, that's what, so you don't openly try, do not form a communicative connection, if possible, between these things because you could possibly open yourself up to attachment. Yes, that is possible. Uh, I, I think that is feasible. Yes, I do agree with that. Absolutely. So. I've had a lot of cases of investigators, Chris. They come back and say, oh, now I got an attachment. There's something in my house now. or There's something bothering my kids and all that. And some people foolishly take children. On investigations with them. That's a big no-no to my book. I, I never would do that because children are very susceptible to these things and to attachments. You don't. You want to be very careful going in and coming out of these situations. Guard yourself going in and coming out because you do not know what it is you're really dealing with most of the time, and you got to take that into uh, into uh, question. You got to be very careful with it. So I've had many, many cases. Of investigators that come by to me, oh, I got an attachment now. There's something in my house. There's something I'm screwing around with my life and my kids and my wife and whatever the case may be. You don't want it to happen. You don't want to ever get to that stage. You want to keep that from prevent that. You know, as I was saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. That's very true. Prevent it as much as possible from ever happening. And those attachments can, just like the, the objects we, we were talking about earlier, and all that, and I could tell you some stories about that. But the interesting thing is, even objects can get attachments, okay? And you got to be very, very careful what you're dealing with here, folks, because this is the unseen. You can't see it until it's too late or too, until it attaches to you and does something to you that you don't want it to do. You don't want to put yourself in a dangerous situation. You want to investigate and you want to and in research. There's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. That's how we learn things. But you do it the correct way. Don't do it the wrong way. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of people, they, they see what they uh, watch off TV and, and they reenact that. So, and I think they do that in, in the wrong way. And I think that causes them problems. Oh, yeah. So, yes. I really do. But and you know, that, uh, you've got to be very careful, Chris, uh, with the spiritual things because they can very badly affect you. They can attack you in ways you never would dream possible, okay? Uh, they have ways to do that. They have ways to get into your life and into your, into your body in certain ways. You do not want this to happen. You want to prevent it. That's the main thing. But yeah, if you want to investigate and you want to learn, there's nothing wrong with that, definitely. But like I say, do it the right way. Don't don't go in screwing around or doing stuff like Ouija boards, tapping on tables and uh, tarot cards and all that stuff. Be very careful what you're dealing with. You might do it the wrong way and you might pay for it. Uh, just like with, uh, and I've told this many times about objects, be careful what you bring into your house. You don't know the history of it. Let me tell you a quick story, okay? Right quick, and we got to wind it up here. Let me tell you a quick story. And a lady called me one time, and she said, um, uh, you know, I got some freaky stuff going on in my house. My doors opening, you know, cold spots, faucets being turned on, lights being turned off and on, you know, the usual stuff. 
And she said, uh, and I've been living in this house 30 years. Nothing has ever happened before. Well, that was a bing, you know, the bell went off. Aha. What have you brought into your house recently? I asked her. She said, oh, nothing, really. Uh, I said, you had not brought anything in, no statues or anything? She said, no. Well, I bought a love seat at a yard sale a couple of weeks ago before all this started happening. She said, could that be it? I said, well, here's what you do, ma'am. I said, go back to where you bought that love seat and find out the history on it, okay? And come back and call me, okay? Well, she called me a couple of days later. She said, how did you know about that love seat? I said, I didn't know anything about it. What you talking about? She said, well, a man committed suicide on that love seat. I said, ah, there you go. Get rid of that love seat. Yeah. And we, we talked about that on previous shows about uh, uh, furniture and that old man and his recliner. Get out of my chair. It's my wow. chair. You know, his favorite chair. Uh, we've seen that in movies. But uh, I mean, you got to be careful. You, you just don't know what you're buying, especially wow. in, in antique stores and so, and so forth. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, uh, Chris, some people are that way, too. Be careful who... Who you associate with, they may have an attachment. And I have known this to happen. This is freaky, I know. But sometimes people with an attachment can leave that attachment with you if they're not careful. Yes, that is true. That is true. Well, Dennis, once again, an awesome show. I'm, I'm glad that you got to come on and attend. A fascinating subject. Uh, uh, my rim pod my only went off one time, so... Uh, that that's a good sign. My light didn't go off during this show like it did last show, so that's interesting. But uh, yeah, uh, it's gonna be on tonight at uh, tonight at nine o'clock, hunting the shadows. I'm gonna have a surprise for everyone out there tonight, and uh, also we're gonna talk about living dinosaurs. So it's nine o'clock on the Midnight Road U Midnight Road YouTube channel. All right. There you go. Well, take care of Dennis. We'll see you shortly and uh, God bless. And uh, everybody, we'll see you at nine o'clock. And uh, when we talk about uh, cryptids and the news. So take care, everybody. Good night. Bye bye. Ha, 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 ha.